want to just welcome all of you to Manny's. For almost 20 months, we have been in a pandemic. And we're beginning to reemerge. So what do we need? We need some inspiration. We need some hope, which is exactly what Clyde has done for all these decades. And so we thought, you know what? Let's share some of that magic mm -hmm. with, with the world. And so those of you who are streaming live on Zoom, thank you for joining us and on Facebook land. We're very, very happy to be here. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, a woman that if you go on her web, our website, glide.org, by the way, her accomplishments are two pages. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the incredible work um, Karen has done and why we are so lucky to have her at Glide. Um, Karen is our president and CEO for the past four years. She has brought to Glide um, not only leadership, but heart and passion, uh, and an understanding of how the world works. Now remember, when Reverend Cecil Williams came into July 1963, he said, we're gonna change the world. We're not just gonna change San Francisco, California, and the US, but the world. And that has, is manifested in, in what Karen brings to the table. Um, just to give you a brief highlight, and let me tell you, please go on our website because she has over 20 years of experience advocating for human rights. She's been on the front lines of the, in the Middle East, working with Palestinian youth groups to organize and advocate for nonviolent change. She's worked to free sex slaves in Afghanistan, to prevent child and exploitive labor in Bangladesh, to end torture in Iraq, to free political prisoners in Ethiopia, to reform abusive security forces all around the world. She has worked for President Obama as an appointee there. Uh, she worked for Secretary Hillary Clinton. Um, she has been a Chief Innovation Officer for the United Kingdom Department of International Development. Um, she's worked at our State Department. She's worked with our UN. Uh, she was Vice President for International Peace and Stability for a Fortune 500 company. She went to Harvard Law School, I mean Harvard Business School, then got a degree in law at the University of Washington, and she went to American University. And I'll talk about that in a minute. She speaks Arabic and French. She was named in 2018 San Francisco's Business Times Most Influential Woman in the Bay Area. Yes. Now on a personal note, I met Karen, it was probably August uh, um, 1993. We were both first year graduate students studying international peace and conflict resolution at American University. Wow. And for two years we were classmates in the same program. We graduated on the same day. Wow. She obviously went to do some bigger and greater things. <laughs> um, and when I was on the board of directors of Glide before becoming a staff member, which is her fault because she's the one who told me to get off the board and, and do this job, um, we hired her. And it has been one of the best decisions Glide has ever made. Um, we talk about light. We will be talking about light in the world of darkness. And Glide, the last few years, was in a, a period where there was some darkness because folks were trying to dim our light. And it was actually Karen, um, with her skills in peace and conflict res uh, resolution, moral jujitsu, as we were learned in, we learned in school, um, but also your ability as a lawyer to negotiate. Karen saved Glide. And I cannot say that and emphasize that enough. She had the patience to deal with what we were dealing with, and she allowed us to continue our light as Glide. So she deserves a round of applause for that. So this is gonna be a conversation, right? And from it, we hope you are inspired. Um, and we hope that you walk away with some of what we see every day at Glide. And so, Karen, you know, you've been all around the world and you have worked in some very harsh conditions, Afghanistan being one of them. And now you find yourself on the corner of Ellison Taylor. What brought you to Glide? What drew you to this 
place in the tenderloin here in the city. Can you all hear me? Or should I use this? Yes. I should use yes. this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, first, Miguel, thank you for that uh, introduction. Okay. And I will do my very best to live up to that extraordinary picture of me that you just painted. Um, uh, it is true, Miguel and I are friends and have been friends since we first met in 1993. And um, it is serendipitous that we came full circle at this point in our lives and ended up um, working together at Glide, which is where we started in our program um, around social justice, unconditional love, all of the principles that, um, that Glide stands for right now. So, um, so what brought me to Glide is, uh, it, it's been a long path, so as Miguel said, for many years, I, uh, I've had a passion for human rights and justice. Um, and I have done that around the world in um, a lot of area, countries in conflict, um, just countries that are hard, hard to be in. Um, I've spent most of my career doing that. Um, and along the way, after a number of years of doing that, I began to just pay more attention to my own backyard and to the issues that we face here in America. Um, and what was very clear to me is that um, I was using all of my education and skills and experience to um, make, social, make change around the world when really we needed more of it here in the U.S. So um, when it comes to human rights and justice, um, and equity and poverty alleviation and women's rights um, and uh, uh, everything under the social justice umbrella. We had a lot of work to do. And so um, so when Glide came to me and uh, raised this opportunity, um, it fit, it was just right. It was just right for me. Um, and um, the issues, um, that, that we work on at Glide, um, the trend, we are part of global trends. We are part of both on, on, the, on the side of oppression and injustice. That, that is what's happening um, around the world is also happening uh, often here in San Francisco, um, in the United States, across cities. Uh, but also on, on the, the side of hope and um, uh, and inspiration. There are people, um, you know, there there are people who are making social change and fighting for justice. That is a global movement. Um, this reckoning around racial justice in the United States, racial justice and and oppression um, of of many groups. Um, that is happening all over the world. And there are also movements, pop, popular movements that have started with the people, just like here, just like Black Lives Matter, just like the way other groups have organized here um, in the United States. It's now about people like us organizing and driving change. And that is what brought me to Clyde. Wow. Well. Like I said, we are so glad you're here. And um, you're right, Glide has always been, uh, if you look at all the social movements that happened around civil rights, racial reckoning, LGBT rights, um, Glide has always been a part of those movements in the last 21st century, starting from Compton's cafeteria, when Glide played an important role to making sure that the, the, the lives of transgender women are protected. Um, there were gay marriages in 1967, Happy Night Glide. Um, so every social movement, Glide has been there, and having your wisdom um, help us look, helps us look at the next series of movements that we have to build as a community. So 20 months almost, we have all been um, stuck in our homes, uh, fearful, uncertain, most of us here are actually lucky that we have a home to be able to go and be stuck in, right? So Glide works with a community that is not as lucky as we are. And 
and um, in some cases, places were boarded up. But Glide kept going. How was it for Glide, and for you as the leader of Glide, um, when everyone was saying, shut down, shut down, what was happening, and how did you take us through that? So I, I actually, I love this question, because um, when people ask, how is Glide holding up during the pandemic, and how are we done, um, I get to bring one of the good news stories of, um, of our area of the pandemic, and that is that um, from, the, from the very beginning, um, it wasn't a question of do we keep our work going or do we not, should we, you know, should we do it or not? It was how are we going to fulfill our mission, provide our services, fight for social justice, during this pandemic. And right from the beginning, we had, we have this incredible staff, some of whom are here today, who are, um, they're constant innovators and what I, and problem solvers on the front lines of everything that they're doing. So our harm reduction team that is going out to the encampments, um, their outreach, I mean, they're, they're constantly looking at how do we do this better? How do we serve people better? How do we help people transform their lives and heal? Um, so we, this, this cuts across Glide because Glide has been on the front lines of poverty and injustice for so many decades. There's this culture and practice of adaptation and uh, this passion for making change in people's lives. Um, and that is what showed up in full force at the beginning of the pandemic. Right away, um, we, our services shifted immediately. Within a couple of days, we were, we were serving people on, on the streets outside. We were doing everything outside. Our harm reduction team is outside most of the time anyways. But we, you know, the, the adaptation was fast um, and it was big. And so what the pandemic has done for Glide, I think, is really shine a light on what Glide does in this city and for this city and for the residents of the city. Uh, and, and I don't just mean people living on the streets or people struggling with addiction and, and mental health issues. I, I mean people who are looking for community, who are, who are lonely and looking for um, acceptance. Um, I mean people who might be quite wealthy but are looking for, for meaning and purpose and a way to be part of the solution. And that's actually, that's the story of Glide in the pandemic. I should, there is another side of the coin, which is that we're all, we are all human, like everyone here. And so um, it has been hard on stuff. It's been, um, people have experienced this pandemic, like all of you, um, which is all the hard work. There is loneliness. Um, there is uncertainty. Um, and so the good thing about Glide is that we, we find solace with each other. We find community with each other. It's harder during the pandemic, but I think, I think Glide has done well. I'd like to hear your answer to that question too. Well, you know, you're, you're so right. We, we had to pivot. Um, and uh, one of, I think the most incredible stories of that pivot was, I don't know if most of you know, there's about 50% of the people who work at Glide are former clients, people who were in the streets and who want, got into our programs, whether they're it's recovery or, or other things, they, they came to Glide, they got help, and they're now working at Glide. And Glide is a safe place. And so when the shelter in place happened, and a lot of us were forced to work from home. For some of those staff, it wasn't safe to be at home alone. And so what did Glide do? Glide went ahead, told all our volunteers, you don't come in, and we redeployed staff who needed to be at a place like Glide 
to do the volunteer work that volunteers would have done. I, Glide became a safe place for them to continue to be while we were stuck at home. And that ability to pivot and to think about the other, I, I thought was, was an incredible stroke of genius on the staff and our leadership to be able to be thoughtful in that way, um, to take care of one another. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you hear a lot of people talk about and I've gotten accosted many times, like, what are we gonna do with the homeless, right? But the question really should be, are, why are people homeless to begin with? You know, your thoughts on, on that question, of why are people homeless? And I know you've thought about it a lot systemically, um, and it's informed the work, that, especially with Glide 4. Yeah. You're asking me why are people homeless? Well, no, well, well. <laughs> However you want to answer that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, gosh, that is a huge question. And I think, um, you know, there's so many reasons that people become homeless or housing insecure. And the, the, int the there are commonalities, but really each person has their own individual um, combination of issues that got them to where they are. So at the human level, that is what it is. People's experiences um, that have got them there, gotten them there. There is obviously, to Miguel's point, there is systemic, there are systemic factors that drive um, people into our lines that drive food insecurity and poverty and inequity and homelessness. Some of that is systemic racism. Um, some of it is just systemic in in inequities built into our systems um, and how, how they do or do not um, help people with poverty. Um, it is all rooted, it is all about um, the, the, from a social justice perspective, that, that is what we do. The acts of service we do every day, um, the acts of love, the acts of service, they're all rooted in social justice. Um, but we do, I mean, one of the new things, Miguel oversees the Center for Social Justice, and what we've begun focusing more and more on, in addition to working with human beings and being proximate and treating them, everyone with dignity and helping them find their paths. We are looking at the systems. And not just, not just big systems like the laws and policies that, are, um, that, that really enable homelessness and racism and um, in inequity, uh, but also um, some of the work, for example, that Rabbi Michael Lezak is doing, and I see Rabbi Lezak in the audience, which is, um, you know, systems are, there are big S's, medium S's, and little S's systems. There are institutions of power all around us. There are corporations, that is a system. The, the police, that is a system. Um, the work that Rabbi Lezak and the Center for Social Justice is doing, they're focusing on how do we transform the individuals in these systems? Doctors, healthcare administrators, police, district attorneys, um, corporate leaders, corporate employees, how do we change their hearts and minds? How do we build empathy so that then they go back into these systems, these institutions of power and, and drive change there? And we've had um, really great success with UCSF, the biggest employer in, in San Francisco. The changes that they've been made internally are transformative for, for people um, throughout the system and for health outcomes, um, there, there, there are, there's transformative change. Um, Rabbi Lizak has driven, works with police who go back into their system, district attorneys who no longer seek the death penalty. There, 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 there are different ways we are trying to affect systems. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that all that systems talk. It's not very exciting, but it's really important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's a little jargony, but it's it's important. But along with that sort of policy and systems work, is how do we change people to see the world the way Glide sees it? 
you know, Michael always talk, Rabbi Michael always talks about Goliath goggles. Um, there's an incredible perspective that Glide has. Most people during pandemics or during situations like we found ourselves in the last 20 months give up hope. Most people see the situation of having lost your job or lost your apartment as helpless. And what Glide does is say, you know what? Where there's a will, there's a way. You know, we're here one time. How do we help each other? How do we put those glide goggles on and say, you know what? We are not going to get paralyzed by this situation. We're going to see the light. And at glide we say, we're not just going to see the light, but we're going to be the light. Because what takes darkness away? It could be one candle. Now if I had a candle and Karen had a candle and we help light your candle and all of a sudden, your candle. What, ha what happens? There's no more darkness. And so this is what drives our work, is seeing the people who come into our lines, whether those who come to Glide seeking food, or even doctors from UCSF seeking a better way to heal. I always say, and I know Karen agrees with this, that there is something for everybody at Glide. If you're searching for meaning, if you're searching for a little bit of hope, come to Glide, because you'll get it. And you may not get it with us. You may get it with a person who's standing in the line that has nothing but love in their hearts, and all of a sudden, you're like, wow. And one recent situation that happened, we had someone in, in our line who called my name. I didn't know who this person was. And I'm talking to them and they're asking me how my day is going. I'm like thinking of all this other stuff. And he said, you know, I've had bad days too. But you know what, your day is gonna get better. This is someone who has nothing telling me. But it, well, the beauty of it was that all of a sudden I'm standing in front of another human being. And all those things that, that society says you have to look out for, what they look like, how they sound, what they're wearing, or even how they smell. All that goes away at Glide. And you're able to see humanity at its best. And for me, that's freedom. Because at Glide, we help you to walk among the world free. To put all that stuff aside and look at people at on a human level, and I, I think that that's an incredible thing that that we have at Glide. That was beautiful. <laughs> it's true. It is true. Um, this is uh, why Miguel is such a you know inspirational leader and, and can really reflect Glide's culture and essence um, uh, when he when he talks about who we are and how we do it. You know, I think one of the one of the things that I would add is we all know that this city there is there are multiple layers of crisis happening here and it has been building for years before the pandemic. Um, it's this mix of homelessness and drug substance use disorders and mental health issues. The, the, the hardest problems to solve are the ones that are most visible to us on the streets and, and everybody has seen them. And that, the landscape of, of that need has really expanded across the city. And so part of what we're doing as we are building this next generation of Glide is it is rooted in what Miguel is talking about, which is our values of unconditional love, bringing hope, um, treating everyone with love and dignity, and that will never go away. That is who we are. That is how we transform. Um, in addition to that, we are building, we are trying to make sure that we are better than ever at not just helping people get up off the streets in the moment, but help them stay off the streets. We're working 
with people to build more sustainable solutions um, for, for all of us. Because when people talk about San Francisco, uh, this incredible city, if you hear somebody say, well, it's not really, it's not livable anymore. But who, it's not livable for who? It's, it's not livable for the people living on the streets. Um, it, is, it is hard for, uh, for everybody, um, whether you're living on the streets or whether you're walking in the vicinity, wanting to be a part of the solution, wanting to do something but not knowing how. And so we are, um, that's a big part of what Glide is focused on these days, is really um, helping the city at a bigger scale in more places um, get people back on their feet, onto paths um, where they are transforming their lives for good. Yeah, and that's what's sustainable, right? I, I, I mean, there, there's this, this thing that I like to talk about sometimes is, you know, I'm looking at this group of, of incredible people here and you all are so different. I know some of you, you know, from folks who work in city government to work, folks who work in harm reduction. I mean, like Jason, I mean, you actually save people's lives. And I always think at the end of your life, what do you want to be known for? What do you want people to say about you? Think about it. Have any of you ever written your own obituary? Okay, right? It may sound a little bit morbid, but it really can help you outline what you're gonna do with your life. What type of people you wanna empower and what type of legacy you want to provide. And you know, Jason, you're there every day. I remember this, this man right here, Jason. Someone literally died on the fifth floor and um, we, had, we gave five cans of Narcan which is a thing to bring someone back. And it's, you have to be patient, you have to wait five minutes, correct? Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, yeah. I asked, do you ever think it wasn't gonna happen? That, you know, you gave them five or seven things of Narcan. And I said, did you ever think you just, you weren't gonna be able to bring this person back to life? And you said, well, someone did it to me. And imagine if that person had given up on me. Right? That's what it's about. Never giving up on people. And, and also, be known for the person to love people, not give up. And I think that's what we try to do at, at Glide, in profound ways. Not just in terms of people who come for our services, but even our volunteers. We, we have a group, um, we have folks come from all over. And, and we always we tell them, you know, um, there are people that you're going to see angry in this line. Now, if you haven't eaten for 24 hours, you'd probably be angry too. What is it like when we're starving? We haven't eaten for about four hours, right? We get kind of like cranky. Hangry, Hangry right? Hangry, yeah. So when you see people upset on the street, maybe because they haven't eaten. And you know a little bit what what's that like. You know, poor folks, let me tell you, they're hustlers. Especially for homeless folks who come to Glide for, to find a, get a shelter reservation. You have to hustle to find a place to sleep at night. Um, so Karen, how did Glide become that beacon of light for so many movements, especially in the city? So that is a good and uh, really important question. I think, um, you know, it goes back to the, the, the essence of what GLIDE has always been, which has been um, rooted in unconditional love and acceptance. It is a place where everybody always has been and always will be welcome. And I, it started at a time, you know, Glide really rose. Glide, it was through Glide's church. And it really rose when Cecil Williams took the crosses off the wall, threw open the doors, and invited everybody in. Everybody. And 
proceeded to then advocate for and protect and stand up for every marginalized group, every group that was discriminated against, um, every disempowered group. Um, Glide became this beacon of protection and, and light for these groups because they found a place where they were deemed they could find a way to love themselves. Uh, I think another part of this is also um, part of Glide's journey and part of what it does is, is um, it helps people find their voice, know themselves, know their stories, no matter what has happened to them in their lives. Um, it helps people look, kind of have the courage to look inside deeply and and accept themselves and be able to tell their story um, in our community um, and, and that is part of healing and I think Glide is a healing, it is a place of healing um, which uh, which brings light. So these are these are Glide's roots and uh, and they're still who we are today. Yeah, no that's so true. And know that all of you are part of Glide now. Now that you're here, you're part of this community called Glide. So, you know, I'm going anywhere, okay? <laughs> We're stuck with each other. Karen, you, so you do a lot of work at Glide to make sure that the organization is running. Uh, you hear every single societal issue that comes through our door. Um, how do you find inspiration to keep going? Yeah, so this for me is a is an easy question because of all the people at Glide, I have the easy job, which is to oversee and to lead and to um, to help build the next generation of Glide and to get everyone uh, involved in that mission. But what the thing that keeps me going is the work and the staff. I can't say this enough. When you go to Glide, when you are there, you have to be there to really understand what people are doing. On the front lines, out, whether it's right in our building, a few steps outside of our building, in encampments now, in other neighborhoods, the way that our staff shows up, and it's not transactional, it isn't services, it is about wrapping their their arms and themselves around people to, to see them for who they are and to help solve, help them in that moment. So the work is inspiring. The, the, the courage of the people on our staff at every level is um, even more inspiring. People have to see themselves, they have to see hope. They have to feel like a human being and that there is hope for them to get on another path. And people like our harm, it, our harm reduction team, um, others on our staff, that's what they do in a way that is, is really magical. That's how I find hope. What yeah. about you, Miguel? So, you know, uh, it, there was some, our former president made it so that there was a lot of dark time, right? And um, every morning you'd wake up and they'd be like, oh Lord, what did he say? What did he do? And then you have some of the folks who followed him. Um, you know, that's heavy. Because even now, even though he's gone, he's still not gone. And you have these folks who are just so angry. So what gives me inspiration is I wake up every day and say, thank God I'm not like them. <laughs> thank God I am not like them. But I'm not that angry. Right? It's easy for us to get angry. It's even for us, it's easy for us to even hate people who may be different than us, who don't want to get vaccinated. But what did Martin Luther King say? I've decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. Be on the right side of even the current history that's being made today. I often look in history books 
if you look at like the, the photographs of like the civil rights movement, and I like to see who's on the side just watching, or at the counter at Woolworths, who's who are those people that are pouring stuff over those folks' head? Where do you want to be? Right? So that's the question we got to ask ourselves. And hopefully, you will also choose love. Because hate is too great a burden to bear. You know, we've talked a lot about Glide, and, um, you know, a lot of times we can think that, oh, the world is crushing down on us. But in this room, you have plenty of examples of that there's an alternative way of waking up and saying, yes, thank you for making me good. Thank you for making me a better person. Thank you for helping me, giving me the ability to choose love rather than hate. Um, sometimes when I have some family members that get a little cray cray, you know, or friends that get cray cray, and they're all like, ah, ah I want to say, aren't you tired? <laughs> It gets so exhausting to, to be that negative, right? It must be tiring. So I'm glad we were like, you know what? No, there's a better way, and you're part of that better way. Um, you know, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience, if you're okay with that. Um, if not, then okay. But if, if there's anything, yes, sir, if you can stand up and state your name. Sure. Um, Eric McDonald, um, and like most folks in the room, I wear many hats. Most important one, I'm married to Hydra Mendoza. Yes. Um, yes. Secondly, I'm a friend and fan of Miguel Bustos. And thirdly, relevant to this conversation, I'm the chair of the San Francisco um, African American Reparations Committee. And we have the ginormous task of offering a plan to the Board of Seuss that speaks to the harm and the repair um, that the city has caused for black folks. My question is, you know, it's clear that part of the magic, part of the light that Goliath brings is this sustained hope. And I'd love to hear you just think of or reflect on how hope can be embedded in a reparations plan. Because while I know we will figure out the numbers, we know that this, you know, you listen to William Darity, econo economist, says $13 trillion is the debt nationally. What's San Francisco share of that? We'll figure out legislation and policy. So we'll do a lot of that. But I almost feel like we can be long-term successful unless we can figure out how to embed love and hope um. in the plan. Um, I was just going to say, and then I'll just say, oh, you got it? Go for it. No, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. No, 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 I, no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> please. Go for it. Um, so what I, I want to first say is that what we're going through in America is something that has been happening around the world the past number of decades, this this um, world of truth, justice, and reconciliation, and we're actually late to the game. Yeah. Um, you know, there are other countries that figured out decades ago that there must be a re not just a reckoning. There, the truth must be told. A a justice must happen, and that justice is often, de it needs to be defined by the people, the victims, by the communities themselves. But in this, you know, what I have seen um, around the world in, in this, in terms of the hope and the, and the love, is that the, the, you must start with the truth, and telling that truth, and finding ways um, to, to create uh, big ways for people to, to tell that truth and to, for people to, uh, it's a collective truth. This is our collective history um, as America. And so um, the real hope that I see is when, when people see a difference being made. So um, I know reparations is, is one of those paths, one of those, um, one of the ways to make a difference. But 
um, you know, running the process rooted in love, love and compassion, it, the whole process can be couched in that. Um, it must be for us because, because um, you know, we've all got to come along, everybody, the haters, the people in the middle, the people leaning forward, everybody's got to get to a different place. And so leading with that love and compassion, um, the sh covering it in, in that um, it is the way forward. But then also real difference, taking steps that actually matter is where I've seen hope, uh, hope live and last. I just would add, there are a lot of us here that aren't African American. And when we hear reparations, we need to understand that life is not a zero-sum game. That it's not if Afro-Americans get something that we don't get something. We should celebrate if African-Americans get reparations. Because it's not zero-sum. And a lot of times people get stuck with that, right? We learned that in school, right? It's like, well, if, if, women's get, if women get their things, then men won't. We can't be thinking about it like that. Because life is not like that. Um, so, uh, Eric, we will be talking. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do think, I think, uh, this is my first time meeting you, so I hope the next time you stand up, you also say that you know me and that you are my friend as well. Because <laughs> I kind of felt left out. <laughs> That said, I think San Francisco, because it is progressive forward-leaning, it's always on the forward edge um, of issues like this. I think it, it can be a model. I, it can the way that we proceed. I mean, reparations is just one piece of it. Um, to to your point, and I, I really do feel like San Francisco, as as a city, um, can be a model. So we're happy to talk more. Thank you. And all of us could be on the right side of history by supporting that. We have an opportunity, right? Um, another one more, one more question? Anybody? Yes. Um, so much of your talk dealt with hope and systemic things and, you know, the, the staff inspires you to move on. But I also wonder, like, what do you say to someone who's like me, who's been going to Glide for 30 years, and you, you see all of this great effort, all of this great staff, all of this great fundraising, all of these great programs, all this, like, like, there's been so much love, and there's still folks yeah. on the street. Yeah. And so, like, yeah. like, what do you say to someone who's like, yeah, of course I'll still have my Glide goggles on. What, I mean, of course I'll still give money. Of course I'll still, you know, go and to celebrations, but like, is it, how is it ever going to actually change? Or are we just putting our finger in the, in the dam and doing good? Like, you don't yeah. give up, but like, where yeah. is that? What, what, for, the, yeah. cause you, for the next generation, what do you think? No, I, I, I hear you and, and hear that. Um, I mean, love alone can't end homelessness. Love alone cannot end inequity or racism or, you know, achieve the other goals that we're talking about. One of, the, I'll, I'll make a few points here because it's such an important question. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's it's a great question because I, I do, you're not the only one. You know, people, we have had people come to Glide and say, you know, you are you are perpetuating a problem here. I know you're not saying that. Uh, you know, which, which fundamentally misunderstands the root of the problem and what is happening. But there is there are different levels at which we are helping people and we are historically we have really focused on alleviating suffering in the moment um, we're meeting basic needs loving people with the understanding that it is a necessary foundation for any further change people have to want to change themselves at a human so we're talking about a human level. People have to want to change themselves and be able to change themselves. And that's the first thing that has to happen. Um, so that is the work that Glide has transformed lives for a long time. What we're now doing is adding extra layers and, and, and we have been over time. We're adding additional layers of in addition to the love and the arm and the treating people with dignity 
what else do we need to do for this person to truly get them stable? What are the what are the kinds of services interventions that that these people need that will make a sustained difference? We're very focused on that right now. It is part of um, where Glide what Glide has been building over the past number of years, few years. In addition to that, if if I know systems talk can get a little boring, but if we don't if we don't change systems, if we don't change the drivers, things that drive people into our lines, we will never we will never make headway. Um, and so that's another thing that we are doing. Um, and you don't just go to a system and kind of tweak it and change it. To change systems at all levels, you have it's step by step. It's piece by piece. So um, it's a great question because it really is it's a B question. How do we make a difference? How do we make headway against suffering? Um, and, and that is really what underpins this, um, this next generation of ride that we have been building for the past few years. Do you want to add anything to that? So I, I always tell the, our, our team at the Center for Social Justice that our job is to work ourselves out of business. <laughs> there shouldn't be a need for a center for social justice. <laughs> so with that, there's a sense of urgency. And Karen has charged us to say, okay, we're not just gonna go protest, but we're gonna change the way people see the world and themselves in it, but we're also gonna change the systems. And one of the things we have uncovered at Glide is that not all system laws are just. We have a program called Men in Progress that helps folks who are coming out of incarceration. They come through, it's like, it's like a 50 week program and it's diligent and it's tough and it's good and it helps people see themselves in a better way. Well, there were two gentlemen that went through our program, models, models of what this program is all about. So Glide hired them and said, we're going to hire them to then go out and train other people, right? Because then you, that's how you spread the word. That's how you let the light right, shine. So about a month after we hired them, we get a letter from the state of California saying that we had to let them go because they were on adult probation supervision. And at some point, when this law and this policy was being created, they said if you were on adult probation, you could work full time, not a problem. But if you were on adult probation supervision, you could not have a full time job. It doesn't make sense, right? So we're trying to change that law. Remember, that's a law that someone thought of that really didn't help people. It made matters worse. So, so we're trying to work ourselves out of business and, and we will work hard and continue. I think we, we, we're, we're going to be doing that. But also, just how you view people who come to Glide or people on the street. There's a young woman named Patricia. Um, she was, she's a mother of two, um, worked in a, a legal office, and um, she had an operation on her back and there was an infection, so she got on Oxycontin, and the doctor kept prescribing that drug to her. So all of a sudden, that took her down a different rabbit hole. So one day I saw her at Glide, and she was there to get clean needles. That's my niece. <coughs> she had a job. She has two incredible young girls. My brother goes out and tries to find her to bring her food. So just know that when you see people, that's someone's child. And we're asking you to put on those glide collars and be more human with them. Our final question, Karen. How do you recommend people here 
this incredible group of such diversity in so many levels find some light in these dark times, unless Siri wants to answer that. But, uh, so how do you recommend people find light uh, during these dark times? I don't know what Siri would say. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, I am gonna go uh, with the obvious answer, which is, um, I mean, first of all, I think it is, it's such a natural thing to find light and hope when you're helping someone else, when you can find some way um, to make a change in this world that is not about yourself and is about others. Um, and, you know, there are so many different doors and ways that you can come and connect to Glide. That, that is my answer. Glide is a perfect platform um, for, um, for all of you to engage. And you can come in any, any door um, to be inspired, to contribute, you can volunteer. Um, it's a little harder during the pandemic, but, but there are many, many ways to do that. The thing is that we need, we need you. And we need the people like you here tonight to be with Glide as we step into this next era. We're setting Glide up for another 50 years. So I invite you to come to Glide and find your door um, and find a way that, that Glide can help you find some light in your life. There is a table back there that says Glide Center for Social Justice. Please take her invitation and sign up. You could also sign up on our website at glide.org. Uh, there's a tab if you want to get involved. Like I said, there's something there for everyone. Be on the right side of history. Um, there's a couple of people we want to thank. Uh, I want to thank, uh, well, we both want to thank Debbie Meslow, who helped work with Maddie's to make this happen. Thank you, Debbie Meslow. I want to thank our board member, Hydra Mendoza, who's standing up back there for being here. Um, I want to thank members of the Glide staff. We have members of the Center for Social Justice here, Eric, Rabbi Michael. We have uh, folks from our communications team, our harm reduction team that are here that do the work every day. Um, it's, they're living examples of, of justice um, and the life that's in the, in the world. Um, we want to thank Manny for giving us precious thank you. Thank you to Manny's staff for setting this up, uh, for giving us an opportunity. Um, and I just want to end, if, if I may, with just something that inspires me and where I find hope. And it's really, um, you know, we're named after a, a, an old man that lived 800 years ago. His name was Francis of Assisi, uh, our city's namesake. And one day he sat down and wrote down um, a few words, and I just want to read, read them for you, and hopefully this gives you some inspiration that I get from it. Um, it says, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. And where there's sadness, joy. Grant that I may not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in parting that we are pardoned. That gives me inspiration. So I hope it gives you, you as well. So on behalf of Karen and I, Thank you for becoming part of the Glide family. Thank you for becoming social justice warriors and prophets. And um, anything else, Karen? That's it, no? Thank you. Thank you all. And don't forget to sign up over there, okay? Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.